constraint. In my job, the constraint is the duration. And you have no idea how big a deal duration is in linear broadcast journalism, fixed journalism. This isn't online. It's not like you can make it as long or as short as you want. It's got to be 50 second voice piece for a radio news bulletin, or it's got to be a three minute package for the 10 o'clock news. And while I was economics editor at the BBC, producing this kind of material, the duration was the kind of, that was the thing that you were always up against. You were begging for more time. You were saying, oh, can't I have a minute? That extra 10 seconds is going to make all the difference between a nice voice piece and a not so nice piece. And it's, 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 it was something of an art. Now, it might be that in the digital age, the kind of the, the annoyance, if you like, of the, the, the constraint of duration diminishes because you're not producing a news bulletin that has to be a particular time. However, you're never really going to get rid of the constraints of things like duration and budget and word count for a written piece because all the time you're trying to deliver something to people and their time is busy and they don't want to spend two minutes listening to you if you're not if they if they think you could tell them that same amount of information in one minute. Um, so for me that was that was really quite a thing. I'd come from a sort of semi-academic background writing about economics and stuff and suddenly you're saying I've got how many words? 150 words to tell you about the government's deficit, late, the date, latest figures on the government's deficit or the balance of payments or inflation. 150 words, it's nothing. You can't say anything in 150 well, words. When you speak voice, yeah, I think I, the limit's 22, 23. <laughs> I know, it's like, <laughs> what can you do? Yeah. So that was a concern. Okay, was Heidi, biggest obstacles for you? Um, I think, I think a lot of my friends who, went into journalism and kind of tried to stick it out. There, there is a kind of attrition rate of people who don't quite manage to make it. And I think the main thing is just that going into news journalism, which is, that's my background, is it's really tough. It's a really genuinely tough and quite brutal environment, particularly at the beginning, being a young reporter on a national paper. You do get a bit brutalized um, and you get shouted at a lot and the hours are insanely long. So like when I worked at the Telegraph, I, you know, I started out there as a graduate trainee and then kind of moved into the newsroom as a kind of cub reporter. And I would be starting on the 6am shift and then I'd end up being sent out on a job at 4 and my shift was supposed to end. And I'd be on someone's doorstep until 10 or 11 or 12 at night and then back in, back in at 6am. And, you know, it got to the point where... I just felt like I kind of lost all sense of like time or who I was because I was just working all of the time. And that lasted like about <coughs> two years and it's just quite difficult to um, to stick that out. But I would say if you if you go in and I mean because this is this is a fantastic job, this is such a privilege and it's not really a proper kind of grown-up job being a journalist because it's just too much fun and you have too many adventures and it's too exciting and, and to be like a I don't know, to be a kind of a job in the sense that you think about the job as a kind of burden or an obligation, but it's tough to get into it. And I would say if you can tough it out at the beginning and kind of get a foothold and make your name a little bit, um, then you can you end up kind of passing through that phase, which is difficult at the start, and and kind of uh, um, and then it, and then it's wonderful and things will start to open up. But a lot of my friends kind of couldn't quite deal with that very tough beginning phase, and actually. I think that's changing a lot, so I don't really think that an environment, certainly like BuzzFeed, isn't like that, and I don't know, I don't know where the vice is, but I mean, I, and I, I think that's something about the very macho culture of, of newsrooms and newspapers, and maybe that's changing, but if you find that when you start, things are really, really difficult, I would just say, hang on in there, because it will get better. I had a, 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 we had an intern at Radio 4's Today programme where I worked, and he put it put that point brilliantly well. He said, basically, your first four years, you have to eat a poo sandwich and smile, and, uh, and if you can get beyond that, then your career is going to be fine. But if you can't, that's it. I, I know with BuzzFeed and Vice, you don't have the same time constraints as we do, probably do at the BBC. And a lot of the work that you do is more features and investigations based. Where do those start? What's the starting point for an investigation? How sure do you have to be of the facts? I think for us, um, one of the very helpful things in terms of news gathering is that we do lots of different things at Vice. We make documentaries online, for TV, for film, and a lot of our stories come from characters uh, that may have kind of come in from one thing and then go to another. So for example, 
Uh, we've got a documentary that's coming out on Monday about the illegal rave scene in the UK, and that is kind of filming like teenagers in warehouses in Canning Town and on North Wales and stuff, having these very like drug fueled parties. Um, but one of the things that came out from that is that there's this 22-year-old uh, kid who's not in the film that much, but he uh, he's kind of like the fixer, right? He's like the guy you call if you want to put on a party. He finds you a venue. He does all the stuff with like the squatting laws, and he you know sorts everything out. He's kind of this like weird character. I mean, he came into the office. He's he's a very strange character, but he spoke a lot about that, and that actually kind of brought up the whole like legal side of it and looked at the more. And he's very like politically involved in squatters' rights and stuff like that. So. And then we got kind of another story out of it, and that happens quite a lot. There's a clip there of a Debt Collector, one of our films, which was a journalist coming to us, you know, who wanted to do this whole thing about um, uh, ex-criminals moving to Marbella and all these, and it turned out that there was actually one guy who uh, was just really interesting, who was like, spent a lot of time in prison in the UK, was kind of on a lot of most wanted lists, and now acts uh, as a kind of legal advisor for other criminals in Marbella. <laughs> And that seemed like the interesting side of the story. So I think for us, a lot of the times, it's you know from different parts of the company, characters lead us on to, to new stories. Heidi, you've worked on some huge investigations. Can you tell us about some of them? Um, about about the investigations themselves, or about how investigations in general start? Uh, both. Um, so um, I, I when I was at the Sunday Times, I worked on the Insight Investigations team, um, which um, is kind of like the oldest investigations team. Fleet Street is very kind of established and has this illustrious, very storied history. Um, and uh, there were, it used to be like 20 people, and then when I was there, there were two of us, and it was like everything in newspapers that had kind of shrunk. Um, but we, uh, most recently, just before I left, we did a lot of work on FIFA and um, the corruption, particularly around the awarding of the 2022 World Cup to Qatar. Um, and my colleague Jonathan Calvert and I worked on that kind of over three, four years, um, and ultimately um, we, through kind of having developed sources extensively over time, we got hold of an enormous cache of leaked documents um, from kind of inside FIFA, um, which were, really, it was a huge leak actually, it was, it was 24 terabytes, which is an awful lot bigger than the Panama Papers, um, although the Panama Papers people are claiming that's the biggest leak ever, and it's not, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it was it was just a, it was a huge leak, and we had to um, go away and lock ourselves up in this kind of secret bunker outside London to keep the documents secure as part of our deal with the source. So we just kind of lived in this strange place, trawling through millions and millions and millions of documents, just the two of us, um, for about three months, and then basically pieced together an evidence trail which showed that one man in Qatar had systematically bribed FIFA officials. Um, over the course of the 18 months leading up to the vote on who should host the World Cup and it ultimately effectively bought the World Cup for Qatar. Um, so that was kind of, it was a really interesting lesson for me in, in uh, how perseverance really pays off because we've been working on that story for such a long time um, and we published you know, a series of investigative stories which showed that you know it was highly likely that that World Cup contest had been bought. There was all sorts of very damning evidence about deals that Qatar had done with voters and things like that. Um, but FIFA had steadfastly refused to take any notice, you know, refused to reopen the contest, refused to really investigate properly. Um, and then eventually, just through cultivating sources over many years, we managed to get to a whistleblower who really had the motherload of evidence, which kind of ultimately proved that the World Cup had been bought. It didn't actually lead to the World Cup being re-awarded, um, which we sort of felt that it should have done, but um, it did kind of play a role in the crisis that ultimately engulfed FIFA and led to Sepp Blasser being toppled, which was very satisfying after four years' work. So yeah, just another lesson I drew from that was just, again, hang in there, keep going, you know, and in the end, if, if what you're working on, if, if you're driving at the truth, you will ultimately get there, but you just have to stick with it. Anna, there have been huge changes at Newsbeat. Newsbeat used to be a, a radio news provider. It's now a multi-platform service, which now also works on investigations. Yeah, and I was just going to pick up on a point from Evan about um, time being the limiter. Obviously, now I live in a sort of mid-range world of some of the work we're doing is going on the radio, some of it's going online. Actually, um, one thing I found, and this was more so my previous job, which was at Channel 4 News uh, for five years, where I was sort of dealing with 
turning telly into online journalism was a lot of the reporters would say, oh great, they cut my piece for the telly, but we can put it all online, can't we, Anna? 17 minutes. And I'm like, no, no, no. But it is tempting to think of the internet as this endless dumping ground for good things, but, but not very well edited. Um, and I suppose a lot of the work I did there at Channel 4, and, and now I'm doing similar to you guys, is, is understanding what actually makes good material for online. And, I suppose we'll get to the point that a critical mass is coming where we think we're all writing similarish things about the same topic. You know, if you search for one news story, like a keyword, and look in Google, there's 174 versions of basically the same thing. That's not really particularly valuable to, to, to readers and users. So, to get back to your point, I think it's um, been a, I've been at Newsbeat for 18 months, been understanding how to take the essence of the stories, the journalism, the things we're chasing and investigating and create separate, clear, shareable content from that. And that would mean, if we're going to go and interview somebody about, uh, let's just take a random example, um, the Women's World Cup, one of your uh, topics, um, we don't want an interview to go on YouTube of the captain of the England team talking about her hopes and dreams for the tournament. Because A, it's kind of that day's news, not going to be very interesting the next day. B, it's kind of everywhere. And see, it's going to go out of date the minute they kick a ball. So what can you get from that kind of sense? You've gone and done your radio interview and, and got your audio for that night. What can you do for online that's actually going to be fun, shareable, interesting, and interesting in three months from now, not, not just tomorrow? And it's things you know, like explainers, little life hacky things, uh, get the England player to do keep you up while answering questions about or her favourite whatever. You know, not just sort of silly stuff, but actually shareable, interesting factoids that teach something to the viewer whenever they watch it. So it's that kind of philosophy, I think, is, is how you kind of balance between an online and a, and a radio team. And ho hopefully some of it has worked. And we should be able to watch um, a little extract from where Bob Top has gone. Oh yeah. yeah, great one, yeah. The group that represents Nike for Learners say that in 2005 there were more than 3,000 clubs and that this year it's down to just over 1,700. That means nearly half have shut and the industry is worried. <laughs> Steve Aoki is one of the world's top DJs. He says nightclubs are vital for dance music. They're incredibly important. I mean, this is where the culture has thrived and grown. Without those clubs, there wouldn't be new sounds, new subcultures in, in the dance genre being able to grow. Like You need to have those bases to be able to build um, and expand and push this culture forward. Say they're all in Cannon Town, aren't they, Sam? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great example. Uh, we did a sidebar, so the main that was a sort of 50 minute documentary exploring what happens at clubbing and where they where modern day clubbers have gone. Um, because we got some great data about the closure of I think half 50% uh, of UK nightclubs within a decade. So they're not clubbers aren't on, on British high streets, but they are somewhere. So we did a piece with uh, Meet, Meet the New Clubbers, and it was kind of five different club promoters talking about what they run, where they run it, how they get people to come, how people are more likely to, for example, save up all year for, for a one-off mega night rather than go every week to their sort of local provincial club. And so it was getting them to explain how they've done it rather than just saying it's a fact. Um, but that's a nice example. A big part of what you all do is interviewing. Can you tell me about some of your best and worst interview moments and what makes a good interview, Sam? Uh, certainly worst, I think, once I interviewed Wiley in Marbella and... Well, well done that you turned up, Bristol. Well, <laughs> wait till the end of the story. <laughs> because he, uh, we were just having a nice chat and he was kind of, he was being very open and great and we were talking and he said, uh, hang on, I'm just going to nip off for a minute and then I'll be back in a sec. And I was just sat there with my dictaphone and uh, I was asking his manager, is he all right? Is he going? Yeah, he's coming back in a sec. And the next thing I saw, he was uh, tweeting from a wimpy in Croydon. <laughs> and he'd literally gone to the airport, flown home, and I was just sat in this villa in Marbella. Um, I think the thing about doing good interviews, which is like what I always say to new people coming in, is you can't just like write a bunch of questions and then be like, okay, here, let me ask you one, two, three, four, five. Like, you have to be so interested in what they're saying. And if you're not interested, fake it. Like, you have to listen to every answer they're saying and then pull it apart and work out what that means and like ask a follow up question. And, you know, like, 
if you, as if your life depended on it, try and get to the bottom of what they're trying to say and really push them on, you know, and it, that really doesn't matter if it's a grime artist or a footballer or a leading politician. Like, everyone kind of says stuff without thinking about it and you really need to push them to get the next answer and the next answer until, they, until they've got a better idea of what they want to say and you've asked the question from every possible angle, I think. And that is, I think, if you do that, then you just have to sit down with reams and reams of transcript and, and make it into a into a short package in, in 50 seconds, which is the hard bit. Evan, you're nodding away. No, I think that is, I think listening is absolutely key to, 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 to the interview. Um, I also think, I mean, this is a sort of, it's a big area and I think about it a lot. Um, I think about it better than I actually do it, to be absolutely honest. But I, I think there has been a tendency for people to think that the, the gold standard of interview is the kind of Paxman interview, a sort of a grilling in which you ask the same question 20 times and you make the interview look a bit stupid quite often. And I mean, the truth is, Jeremy Paxman does that better than anybody else can do it. Um, and often interviews, I think, or interviewers have gone awry being a kind of a, a sort of mini-me Jeremy Paxman and not a very good one. Um, so I don't, I, I don't think you should start out from the premise always that your job is to kind of expose this person as the crook that you might think they are. Um, I think you should start every interview with a kind of open mind as to what you want to get out of that interview. So is this an interview where I'm trying to elicit emotion from the person because that will be interesting to my, um, my audience? Is this an interview where I'm curious because there's a sort of we're trying to get to the bottom of something and we just need to have a conversation which we're sort of, curiosity is the driving force. Is this an interview where I'm holding this person to account and I'm trying to argue with them about something? You know, there, there's a whole, there's a bunch of different things that an interview can be about. And I think you need to, to work out in advance what it is you're trying to get out of it. What is this person interesting for, to my audience? And, um, and then, so that's sort of the preparation. And then in the interview, listen and don't stick to the checklist of questions you've got in front of you. In fact, I mean, I, I always do have a checklist of questions. And the annoying thing about it is that it does, it does you know, it drives you to some extent trying to get to the next question. Um, and, and it does, in a way, sort of stop you listening as well as you should. So as much as possible, have a checklist and then throw away your checklist and listen to what they're saying and, and, and make it a, a really useful conversation exactly as uh, Sam says. Where do you think the future of journalism lies? What do you think it will look like, this industry, in say five years time? <laughs> in about four or five minutes. I, I don't know, I mean, let's talk about the duplication we see today. I think we'll be I think in terms of digital news, we won't live in this slightly noisy, repetitive world so much. I think, you know, you already see it with the way Facebook's algorithms are driving news content now, and video especially. Um, there's a real appetite by the tech firms currently to, to sort of um, flog our wares and, and, and get our stuff to the right eyeballs in the right way. How that really fits with us as independent of, of, of their kind of commercial targets, who knows, and we have to tread carefully. But I think we will get to a place where lots more news is distributed according to uh, data about the individual and you'll, you'll see videos pop up for you in your stream depending on what you previously viewed uh, and you'll have content that is kind of a bit more uh, tailor-made for, for different audiences. I'm not saying that's good, I think there's a real merit in just happening upon things you didn't think you were interested in. I think it's increasingly the way things will work, and the, and the idea of going to like Google News to find out what's happening in the news will indeed be dead. That will feel like a kind of old-fashioned parish notice type affair, I think, within five years. So I think it's about how we manage ourselves through that kind of new world, and try not to let Zuckerberg have too much control over how we put out our content. I also think, if you look at two of the big global journalism successes of the last couple of years, one of them is Serial, the podcast, and one of them is Making a Murderer, the Netflix TV show. Both of them are about stories that have existed in the public domain, have been covered by various different news outlets for a very long time. 
And what they did was they took all that information and then they went a lot further and redid all the interviews and did proper investigation. And I think that that is a trend that is very noticeable in journalism across the board because if you look at something like news like EO, you're not going to get whatever David Cameron to come and, on your smaller documentary production, most likely. And so people do, you know, try and reinvestigate stories from the past and look at things that are already in existence. And actually, some people don't like that, but I think that can be incredibly fruitful in terms of, especially if you're getting into journalism, you know, it's a great starting point to look at a story that already exists and go, hang on, if I look, speak to all these people again, you know, in the time that's gone since this happened, how have things changed? Is there something more that could be got out of this? So I think that that can be quite a good thing and quite a good way to sort of differentiate. Just, just to chip in on that as well, I think exactly right, Serial and Making a Murder proved once and for all, thank goodness, that people don't have the kind of the um, attention span of a gnat. People do want to commit time and their, their kind of, you know, their eyeballs to one thing for, for a binge session. So actually, and, and obviously Netflix and Carl are, are very good at driving things to you based on what you've previously viewed. So I do think there's a real appetite to get stuck in and watch things and really engage, rather than this constant feeling of, oh, just turn everything into a 30 second video on, on YouTube. When people talk about traditional media dying, newspapers dying, People are watching linear TV. Do you think that is true? Do you think that will happen? I think that will happen. Um, I mean, I, I, I caution against people who think this is going to happen as quickly as some do. I mean, I think you have to remember that the demographics of the nation are <coughs> aging. And I mean, what's been fascinating to me, how many people here have ever listened to Radio 4? Some, quite a few of you have. What's fascinating to me is that in this cacophony of new media um, and dying old media, newspapers really struggling, television <coughs> news programmes and news night audiences just diminishing slowly by two or three percent a year. One piece of the media that has flourished, a brand that is considered, you know, valuable, respected, and the audience just drifts very slowly up, is BBC Radio 4. And, <laughs> So what is going on here? Well, part of it is it 